I'd like to welcome everybody who's who's joined uh, us. I specifically like to, to thank Sally and Sergio and Genevieve and Amy and others who helped put this together. Um, I want to thank those of you who are joining us and your interest in the Desert Health DC and our shared resources. And for those of you who are on this call who got basically two connections to WebExes, um, I want to make sure that um, if there are any Spanish speakers on the call that they know that there is a Spanish language version of this um, coming up next week, which will be led by Sergio Avila. Um, Sergio, do you want to tell people that in Spanish? Oh, right now? Yes. Yes, uh, Dwayne, thank you. Buenos días a todos. <coughs> tener el, el seminario esta mañana sobre el, el proyecto de conservación y planeación de, del paisaje y eh, que lo va a dirigir Duane Fu de Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory y yo voy a hacer el mismo seminario en español el martes 30 eh, para todos aquellos que estén interesados en, en saber más de este proyecto y de saber de la nominación de áreas piloto. Gracias y saludos a todos. Dwayne, I think we'll just want to go ahead and mute everyone else's line just for the presentation portion, or do you want to keep that open? Up to you. Um, I, you can mute it just in case there's background noise. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and mute everyone. Dwayne, you'll need to press star six after I do that to unmute your line, okay? The conference is now in silent mode. Okay, so if anybody does have a question in the middle, um, use the little raise your hand thing or whatever, and then uh, Sally or Jen or somebody can can interrupt if if we need to. Um, so several years ago, um, many of us in the conservation world, and uh, thankfully a lot of the leadership in the Department of Interior recognized that resources we manage were becoming ever increasingly under pressure from a variety of stressors, including things like land use change, energy development, natural hazards. The list goes on. We've all experienced it. We, we see it with major drought, the impact on reservoirs, flooding issues, wildland fires, and other things. Um, but in recognizing that it was ever increasingly complex in terms of the interactions between resources, uh, users, uh, stressors, and other vulnerabilities, and the risk to climate change, um, Secretary Salazar, in 2009, signed a, an order that addresses the added and compounding stresses of climate change on resource management. This created the LCCs, where all entities with responsibility would have a venue to work together and, and develop science and strategies to understand and respond to the ever complex scenarios of natural resources management, especially under the sort of larger umbrella of how climate change and uncertainty might affect those things. This order created a, a seamless network of 22 regional partnerships with similar resources, stakeholders, programs, and initiatives to jointly identify science and management priorities. Um, partner agencies are supposed to coordinate with one another while working within their existing authorities and jurisdictions as they sort of implement their programs in a concerted or coordinated effort in those geographies. So the intent was really to, to link science and conservation delivery and to form and leverage partnerships. So, you know, how do they do this? They integrate priority needs and goals across species, groups, and large landscapes, identify the most effective conservation approaches to achieve these common goals, identify science gaps that are shared by the partnership and address those, Avoid duplication through improved conservation planning and design by bringing those people to the get together at the table. You, you find that there are a lot of common efforts going on and that you can leverage your resources and be more efficient in that delivery of those um, individual responsibilities. And in that, not just connect efforts in planning, but potentially connect efforts in conservation delivery as well. So the Desert LCC, which was a part of that, I should go back to it. So the Desert LCC is the one that you see there in orange, number three at the bottom. If 
you look closer at our landscape, um, you can see that it's a binational, very much a multi-resource priority LCC with about 40% of our geography in the U.S. and about 60% in Mexico. It spans two major shared river systems upon which the two countries depend and a variety of terrestrial habitats that link species from Canada to South America. So it's a very important geography, um, not just from a North American continental perspective, but um, actually from a hemispheric perspective. So who is the LCC? The LCC is really just a large group of partners that have common interest in the resources in the territories that um, are defined by the LCC's geography, that are willing to work together. Um, this basically is a, a series of badges of, of each of our steering committee members, but the steering committees are only a piece of the pie. There are many more members, partners, stakeholders who are engaged at other levels within the LCC, especially amongst our working groups and other committees. If you would like to become more engaged in the LCC or have any questions about the LCC, um, these are our current coordinators. They're a very energetic staff and amazingly uh, confident and efficient. We really hope that you would reach out to whichever one of them makes sense for, for you or that you're comfortable reaching out to. Genevieve Johnson is our Desert LCC coordinator. Amy Roberson is our science coordinator. And Sally Hall is our GIS and data coordinator. As an LCC, we are basically autonomous in, in the sense that we're self-directed. And the LCC basically wrote their own mission and goal statement. And the Desert LCC's mission is basically that through collaborative partnership, provide scientific and technical support, coordination, and communication to resource managers in the broader Desert LCC community to address climate change and other landscape scale ecosystem stressors. Within that context, our, our goals are to support, facilitate, promote, and add value to landscape scale conservation to build resource resilience in the face of climate change and other ecosystem stressors. And the way that we do that is basically through four key mechanisms. One is science development and delivery. The second is working with and developing collaborations and, and working in communications. The third is through monitoring and evaluation of the resources that we have. And the fourth is through outreach and education based upon what we do know. The Desert LCC is developing the relationships, information, tools, and needed collaborative landscape conservation design um, to address this. The how we're doing it is really through a couple of key steps that, that are somewhat sequential in their process. Um, in this collaborative process, and it's very much collaborative, it's very very much driven by those of you that are out there on the phone and the, and the other members of the LCC, um, is through this collaborative process, determine the design priorities, um, looking at stressors and priority ecosystems and species, develop from that conservation targets and indicators, map priority ecosystems, resources, and species. We need to know where the systems are. Model projected impacts from climate change and threats. Identify climate change adaptation strategies and critical conservation actions that we can take. And identify opportunities for collaboration in the implementation of those actions. The Conservation Planning Atlas is another tool that we have that will be a part of this process, both as an input and as a delivery mechanism. Sorry. Um, one of the important things here is in this map that you see over to the right, you can see that the Bureau of Land Management has uh, developed and worked on REA's rapid ecological assessments um, for each of these four important terrestrial areas that are part of the desert LCC, the Mojave, the Sonoran, the Chihuahuan Desert, and the Madrian Archipelago. These are some of the foundational information that we'll use as part of this process, along with other um, ecological assessments and vulnerability assessments that have been done by a lot of other partners. But this is sort of the, the cornerstone of, of the type of information that will be used in this process. So what is the process? We've adopted a climate smart approach to develop our pilot plans and implementation framework. There are seven steps in this basically iterative process. 
the steering committee has already identified specific priority resources. And this pilot effort will move forward from there, addressing uh, refined objectives, assessing climate vulnerability and impacts, reviewing objectives based on vulnerability, and identifying actionable climate adaptation options. Um, this process is really focused on steps two, three, and four in this clim climate adaptation framework. And so in step one, it's the, it's the goals and objectives. And that is basically in our, in our framework, uh, we've addressed this looking at what we call priority resources. And those priority resources that have been identified by the steering committee are rivers and streams in their associated riparian areas, seeps and springs in the riparian areas associated with those, and shrublands and grasslands. And also looking at species vulnerable to climate change. And this was basically an iterative process that went back and forth with the science working group and the steering committee and our partners back and forth that really identified these as those key systems that were the highest priority amongst the broader partnership. Well, as we get past that step one that you saw earlier, we start thinking about the second step, which was going to focus on vulnerability. The science team and the critical management question team that addressed monitoring tackled the issue of identifying what we call our critical pressures and stressors for both the U.S. and Mexico. Uh, we had several meetings, including a meeting in Mexico, where uh, a large group of, of Mexican stakeholders gave their input into this. And uh, we found that stressors and pressures were relatively consistent between the two countries with a few minor additions between the two. And so this list of, of 12 pressures and stressors represent uh, that common suite of, of threats um, on the landscape between both the U.S. and Mexico habitats for the desert LCC. So the third step in that process was then to review the goals and objectives and develop uh, common conservation indicators. As a part of that, we need to look at what the goals and objectives are for the partner organizations, putting those together and identifying where those common goals and objectives are uh, that would then become the desert LCC's goals and objectives, identify specific indicators um, that we can use to, to use as a metric related to the ecosystem functions or services and species um, that tell us something about those objectives that have been identified, and then feed those back then to the partnership to review, evaluate in this process, and make sure that we're still on point with the identification of our objectives indicators, and then develop targets to create measurable uh, endpoints for those indicators. So um, are we actually achieving our goals? And that comes later in the process um, if you looked at that seven-step wheel. And so steps two, three, and four are going to all use a large variety of mapping resources. We're going to have to have access to your information as, as stakeholders and agencies and others that are a part of this cooperative, and also other information that's out there in the research and science world. To do this, to pull all of the different resources together that we're going to need, um, we're looking at science bases, which is served by the USGS as an avenue for concentrating a lot of our information and making it searchable. We're going to link a conservation planning atlas that Sally and the GIS working group have developed that is uh, an interactive online uh, mapping source that, that links to a variety of information uh, from other web-served GIS databases or from things that can be uploaded directly into uh, the Conservation Planning Atlas. And it has the ability to link back then also to Science Base, which is where we're pulling together a lot of our core information. The other things that, that we're going to need are, like I said, the information that you have available to you. Uh, specifically, you look at what the Bureau of Land Management and the REAs are, and all of the information that went into the development of those REAs 
Um, those are something that's going to be available to us to help develop the landscape conservation plan and design. Uh, we know that there are other sources of information out there that are going to be very important to this, but it's going to be relevant to the pilot area selected, the resources being addressed, or the issues being addressed um, when we identify those pilot areas. And so the other types of information that might be included in this might be state wildlife action plans, regional vulnerability assessments from groups like individual federal agencies, TNC, World Wildlife Fund, there are several of these out there and things like joint venture implementation plans and other groups that have uh, mapped planning documents that have specific guidance or that um, inventory resources or create scenarios. Uh, the DLTC GIS working group is going to be a resource for us in, in helping us identify data that if we identify something conceptually that needs to be there to help us find that data and, and get it in a, a usable manner that, that we can integrate into this process. And we'll make use of all the various federal data hubs, which includes Mexico's INEHI, uh, the USGS, and even some international sources like the Commission for Environmental Cooperation, if that data is seen as relevant to this process. So if you have resources, um, we would like to know about it, especially as we get down to the pilot areas and start to focus in on specific resources that we need to map, interact with, or integrate into this process. Um, so the Conservation Planning Atlas actually pulls information from a very large variety of, of resources, as you can see here. And it was established by the GIS Working Group, and they are basically the, the, the committee of data stewards, and each agency is responsible for its own data on the hub. Um, but the hub itself helps serve all of that in a common platform that will be available to us in this process. As parts, as, as we move along this process, um, I should have mentioned earlier that I was putting years up on the tops of these slides, and so it gives you an idea as to where in that window we expect to be doing these different elements of the landscape conservation planning and design process. So in this process, we know that there are going to be times we're going to need to, to develop some models or identify existing models that help uh, us understand the current state of, of ecosystems. Uh, develop scenarios to assess relationships of stressors and indicators uh, that include simulations of climate change, um, and identify data limitations and gaps to help direct research and improve uh, the development of future assessments or even existing assessments. So data and modeling are going to be really important to this process, and the better the data that's available to us, the better the product will be. So for those of you who are thinking about nominating an area, remember that. that uh, if you're interested in an area, the better data that we have available for addressing these things, the better the product will be on the out, outside of it coming out. So. The next step after the, the modeling approach is going then into the pre-design phase. In the pre-design workshops, we'll work collaboratively to um, agree on a desired future condition. Uh, we'll work to assess the difference between the current and projected conditions and the future desired conditions. We need to know where we are, where we're going to be, and what that difference is. And we're going to work to determine what actions partners can take that can move the landscape towards what that desired future condition is. And this falls into that concept of they need to be implementable actions by partners uh, based upon the strategies that are then developed. And some ideas of what we think in terms of what general adaptation strategies are, are things like reduce non-climate stressors, protect key ecosystem features, ensuring connectivity. So those are the general adaptation strategies, and we'll need actionable items uh, that, re that flow from this that become those sorts of things that, as a partnership who has on-the-ground land responsibility, we can actually begin to implement those uh, when the plan is completed as opposed to it sitting on a shelf as a bunch of uh, ideas as to things we can do as opposed to uh, actual action that we create energy around and implementation uh, partnerships to deliver. And then after that, um, further down the process, we will look at the design phase. 
Right now, we're looking at those steps two, three, and four, and the design phase is actually phase two of this sort of project. And in that design phase, we look at uh, evaluating and selecting a suite of implementation strategies that meet partners' missions and goals, developing implementation agreements, and then go back and document information and products generated during the design process uh, for peer review. Once we've developed a plan and that plan is uh, in our hands, we don't want it to go on a shelf. Um, we want it to be part of a, a tool that helps us understand where we are uh, consistently in terms of the resources that we care about. And so we know that we need to move towards measurable goals. And in this, uh, we know that those critical pressures and stressors on the ecosystem uh, impact our actual conservation uh, portfolio. As it's affecting that conservation portfolio, we have a series of uh, specific actions that we can then take. And then the question then is, did those actions have the expected outcomes that we were intending as opposed to just outputs? It's not how many dollars or acres you spend, it's whether or not those systems are um, having their ap appropriate function that, that we really want. Are those ecosystems integrity still intact and to what degree are they intact? So we plan on using indicators to help measure to or monitor whether or not those actions related to those stressors have actually impacted uh, the services being provided by those ecosystems or those priority resources uh, that we were addressing. So to build capacity and tools um, to share this stuff, I said that the Conservation Planning Atlas was going to be used as a resource that allows us access to a variety of data. Well, it's not just going to be a, a map of baseline conditions and assessments and inventories, and it's not just going to be mapping ongoing or completed conservation actions and who is doing what where, but it's also going to be that resource of the spatially targeted layers that come from the landscape planning and design process that people like you or your agencies can go to to identify what conservation actions are needed where and what partners are potentially out there to collaborate with you. So this then becomes um, a spatially explicit link to where to work, for what purposes, what implementation strategies are suggested there, and then you can look to identify, hey, maybe somebody like Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory might be interested in working on this with me because I see that this is important to uh, willow fly catchers or something like that. So it's a place to collaborate. The timeline for the delivery of this project is pilot nominations are due July 10th. We're going to have a workshop in Tucson, Arizona, August 4th through 6th. Our second workshop, which will be a Spanish language workshop, will be in August Calientes, Mexico, October 6th through 8th. Pilot area selection will be completed in November of this year. Nominees um, will be expected to be a part of the landscape design workshop working group. The actual nomination is expected to be uh, part of a process where we evaluate the nominees that come in and um, pass those on to the steering committee for their November meeting. So there's a timeline on us. And then the identification of adaptation strategies uh, critical conservation actions and opportunities for collaboration. Those will be in the years 2016 through 17. The peer review process will be in 2017-2018. Uh, revised and final design uh, will be targeted for 2018. And then monitoring will then be in those out years. So it's important as we look at these things that we think about the indicators and the measurement of those indicators that uh, existing monitoring programs already um, funded and supported monitoring programs uh, are considered as a part of this. However, that shouldn't limit us to if we identify the perfect indicator to monitor that, that we do so. So pilot area nominations. Um, the pilot area nominations process will be driven by the the broad sweep of, suite of individuals, not just those that are currently on the steering committee or, or science team, but we're reaching out to the broader community um, 
of individuals or organizations that have uh, specific resource needs, especially those needs that, that allow us to move all the way to the point of implementation strategies. So partners will nominate those pilot areas. In the workshops, we will revise and identify uh, the elements that are required by our steering committee for the evaluation of the criteria. The working group then after the workshops will actually do a pre-evaluation of those. A subset of those from the working group will then be recommended to the steering committee. And the steering committee will create the final approval and select the final nominees. And once those are selected, um, we will go back, circle back to the working group include those nominators in the working group, and then start moving forward with data acquisition, the scenario planning workshops, and adaptation strategies workshops, and move forwards towards spatially explicit targeted conservation actions. So that process in, in terms of sort of an overview of what it would look like then is the areas will be nominated. We'll create the information that we need to um, understand the decision or apply the decision criteria that the steering committee has given us. And that's a very high level set of values. So if a pilot area doesn't meet those decision criteria, it will be dropped from the process. If it meets that first set of decision criteria, then we'll move on to the design criteria, which is sort of the practicalities. Can we, can we actually practically put this together in the time frame that we have? And if so, yes. If not, then that potential uh, area would be moved off to uh, the dropped areas. And then that last set would be a portfolio of potential pilot areas that then would be ranked and evaluated in that working group and passed to the steering committee for the final selection process. So what we're really talking about doing right now is, is very heavily in this uh, decision criteria area, and those of you who are thinking of nominating areas, it's important that you pay special attention to those decision criteria. So what are those decision criteria that the steering committee gave us? First is that the pilot areas need to have a strong nexus to the desert LCC mission. Um, conservation of the landscape scale tied to climate change and other stressors. The second is the potential to implement the design. Um, a diverse partnership, cooperation, and resources need to be sufficiently present and ready to implement the design once there is a uh, targeted design that's out there. Um, the idea here is that this is not an exercise to go on a shelf. This is a testing of the Climate Smart Adaptation Framework to develop plans for the Desert LCC um, at a limited scope so that we can see if the framework works and whatever comes from that framework, we want to be a useful on-the-ground delivery product, not a really nice binder on a shelf. The uh, third criteria was habitat and species diversity. It needs to include species and habitats of management interest and that are vulnerable to climate change. Um, if we're looking at things that are not vulnerable or stressed by climate change, it doesn't give us much of a scenario to plan for. So therefore, um, this effort would be very limited. So we're really looking for those areas that uh, we need to really address that uh, scenario planning process for management interests under climate change. It also needs to be scalable to the larger geography or to a larger process. The results need to be applicable uh, to that, that larger area. So when the pilot area is completed, either existing partners can take that process and apply it to their areas, or um, the LCC, maybe depending on how things go in the future, might be able to then actually scale that process and, and help with implementing that at that larger scale. And the other thing is that the portfolio itself, the, the suite of pilot nominations that we have, need to address all three priority resources. Um, so when we look at the final set of, of pilot areas, rivers and streams, seeps and springs, and grassland shrublands need to all be uh, included in that uh, portfolio of pilot areas. 
the sort of practical design criteria, a subset of that um, is that it, we need to represent the binational footprint of the LCC. So it's important for us to have a portfolio that includes uh, the United States and Mexico. That doesn't mean any individual project has to cross borders. It just means that when the, the pilots are chosen at the end, it needs to be uh, representative of, of both. The data available for the desired spatial analysis has to be available. Uh, otherwise, it becomes sort of a theoretical point. And then it has to be landscape scale. And by landscape scale, we see landscape scale as being driven by the management questions and the risks associated with it. Um, and area is is sort of a, a, a fuzzy number. So uh, we're not thinking in terms of this is my specific um, ranch or this is my specific uh, refuge or anything like that. We're thinking in that larger context of uh, the landscape in which it sets and that the resource questions that you face on that particular uh, project or ranch or whatever are hopefully risks and issues that are reflected by your neighbors as well. So we want to really see a breadth of uh, potentially land ownership, um, a breadth of partnerships, a breadth of, of resource management questions, uh, a breadth of, of risks and stressors that need to be addressed so that as we go through this pilot process, we test the process as well. So in terms of that design criteria, I kind of put together a conceptual slide here of if you think of the circles that are on here as, as areas that are nominated as potential pilot areas for springs, the rectangular parallelograms as grasslands and the sort of linear features as, as streams that have been potentially nominated as pilot areas. What we envision happening and what we hope that happens even before we get to the, to the workshops is that uh, there might be an awful lot of individual uh, nominations or even group nominations so that as you look at these areas where I have overlapping features here, that we might as a group say, you know what, you people who are interested in these springs and these springs over here and these springs over here, along with these people that are interested in these grasslands and these people that are interested in these seats and springs, should maybe get together and create a single pilot area that encompasses that breadth of resources so that we could have a little more efficiency and a, a much better breadth of coverage in terms of the resources and issues addressed in a pilot area. So don't be surprised if you end up going to one of the workshops and we say, you, 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 and you, let's split off from the group here and let's look at, at each of your nominated areas and see if we can maybe create one nomination from it all that, that maybe makes sense. And so these are just examples of how uh, those things might be parsed out. And then when it gets to the working group, the working group might further refine or combine those things as well. So the WLCC pilot area nomination uh, process, we have a series of, of nomination questions. Um, I think it's 16 of them, is that what it was? Yeah, 16 questions, um, four of them are optional questions at the, the end of it. And um, we want you to be succinct and specific as you address these questions. And I can go through the questions individually if you want, but um, I think I'd like to open up the phone line, Sally, so that people can interrupt as we go through this part or ask questions on the previous part before we get to the details of the questions. Okay, we'll do that now. The conference is now in talk mode. So thank All you right. very much. Now we've unmuted everyone. Anyone has any questions for Ian or any of the there's a project or the desert office? Yeah, we're happy to answer them. And, and if you're not asking questions, I ask you to mute your individual lines. Don't get a lot of feedback back around the you guys who are sitting on a um, on a speakerphone, when you speak, it echoes really badly. You're also echoing. And we have a big issue. <laughs> um, 
Um, let me try to it in silent mode again. The conference is now in silent mode. The conference is now in talk mode. Okay, test. Is it still echoey? Yes. 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 So, if we have individuals unmute their own phones one at a time, will that work? Sally? Sorry, what was the question? I said if we go ahead and put it on mute and then anybody who has a question, go ahead and press star six to take themselves off mute. Okay. Okay. The conference is now in silent mode. Mara, I think I saw you raise your hand. Do you have a question? I do. I just hit star six. So can you hear me? Yes. Yes. And am I echoing? Oh. oh. No. Okay, good. Um, you mentioned that there was a workshop in Tucson, and we saw the attachment for that. But you also mentioned a series of workshops. And so is that um, organized after a pilot area is nominated, or, or when is the time frame for that series of workshops? The series of workshops will come after the pilot area nomination process. Okay, and where do those usually take place? Is it somewhere close to the pilot area, or is it in a specific location? That, that's we our intention. Not... Oh, go ahead. I, I was just going to say it's not been predetermined, and, and there's no usual yet. So <laughs> we're, uh, what we envision is that um, after the pilot geographies, geographies have been selected, um, indeed, we would have workshops so they are most convenient to those areas. Okay, and the last question is you mentioned that this webinar will be on uh, YouTube, but will the PowerPoint also be available separately? We can do that, sure. Great, thank you. And Lori uh, has a question, her hand is raised. Lori, if you want to press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. This is Lori. Um, yeah, I, I wanted some clarification on the binational footprint requirement for the pilot area. There's not a requirement that a pilot area be binational but the steering committee did want to see the portfolio of whether it's two or three or whatever pilot areas are chosen, that that portfolio has something binational associated with it. Okay, so so an individual pilot area doesn't necessarily need to be binational. Correct, when we look at the whole group of them together, we need to make sure that there is something still representing. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Peter also has a question. Peter, you pre press star six, we'll be able to hear you. Hi, uh, this is Peter from the Lower San Pedro Watershed Alliance. I noticed that under pressures and stressors, it didn't seem to include um, development sprawl specifically as a stressor. Is there a reason for this? Okay, I think I have that slide up. Do, do you want me to answer that one? I don't know if there's necessarily a reason from it, but it it was mentioned at some of the meetings where pressures and stressors were um, being developed. However, it never came to a higher priority. Um, the ones that you see as the critical pressures and stressors are those that uh, were most common throughout and across the larger landscape. And I understand in urban areas and upon specific reaches, it, it is an issue. But in the sort of larger context of the, the whole partnership, it did not rise to this level yet. And um, so Wayne, and this is Amy. Uh, can I add to that? Yeah, but water use is, is on there. And that is directly affected by urbanization. Go ahead, Amy. Yeah, so um, I just want to give a little bit more background about where this list came from and, and how it was initially developed. It was 
focused on um, it came out of an effort from one of our teams within the Desert LCC that's looking at monitoring um, the effects of climate change and other ecosystem pressures and stressors that may be exacerbated by climate change. And so we engaged our partners in both the U.S. and Mexico to help us understand what some of those uh, greatest pressures and stressors that they are concerned about are. Now, I. I expect that once we've selected uh, pilot geographies, we will re-examine this. That will be part of the process to see uh, what are the pressures and stressors that are most critical in that particular area. Good point. But this is a way to help us um, start to think about the things that are of overall concern across the landscape that may be exacerbated by climate change that we can monitor to better understand how that might affect our, our management and conservation actions into the future um, as the climate is changing. So it's not meant to be an exclusive list, but um, just sort of a priority list for us to be keeping in mind that these are the things our partners um, have collectively expressed the most about at this point. Okay, so it's a work in progress on that particular stressor? I, I, I would say that as the, um, again, as the, once we've selected pilot geographies, um, that we would take a look in each area in discussions with the, the partners and partnerships in that geographic area to determine um, which pressures and stressors uh, should be addressed through this effort in that area. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the question, Peter. Is there anyone else who has a question? Uh, Christina, your hand is raised. We'll take your question. Press star six to unmute yourself. Christina just lowered her hand, okay. <laughs> um, Christina, do you still have a question? Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear you. Uh, to follow up on Peter's question, if we could go back to that slide, please, Duane. I think I can maybe tie that together. It seemed to me from the slide that you showed us um, that there were a couple of factors that were uh, very clear and um, now let's see if we can get back to that slide. One of those was, if I can read this. Um, okay, one of them had to do with uh, potential habitat fragmentation, if I recall correctly. Uh, another yeah. had, had to do with uh, water management and use. And it seems to me that development uh, pressures uh, would certainly be a subset of these uh, indirect ecosystem effects and uh, water water issues. So it seems to me that we can, using the criteria you already have, probably address those issues of in terms of threat and uh, potential uh, issues that may affect ecosystem function. Would that be I, a I think fair correct. assessment? <laughs> you could even yes. include habitat an alteration in that. Storms and flooding are basically only an issue where you have resources of value at risk. I mean, yeah, you're right. It, it folds into many of these. Yeah, so Thank I think that's covered. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll mute myself now. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Is there anyone else who has a question? Um, Lori Simons, your hand is raised. Hi, this is Laurie again. Um, yeah, um, I was looking at the workshops as something to potentially go to, and then in this um, PowerPoint, it sounds like what what the workshop like in Tucson is going to be doing is to kind of review the applications. So that that means that the nominators probably don't want to go to those no. the Tucson workshop. Is that accurate? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
This is Amy Robertson. I'm the site. We didn't do a great job of introducing ourselves here at the beginning of the call, so let me do that now. This is Amy Robertson. I'm the science coordinator of the Desert LCC, and we intend for the workshop to be very interactive, to be an opportunity for people to come together and collaborate to discover new opportunities to do that. Um, we intend to take the nominations um, at the workshop. There'll be opportunities for learning about several things, um, but there'll be a very, the nominators, we really, you are the key people we want at this workshop, actually. So this is a great question. <laughs> um, we want people to come together. We are not thinking of this so much as a competition as, you know, we're queuing up the first few um, areas that we think are going to help us to build this process um, and to really help partnerships that are ready to work together um, and with us. And we want to encourage um, cross-pollination of ideas, lessons learned across different geographies, and give people an opportunity to say, hey, you know, this is important to both of us, and uh, maybe we could work on it together. So uh, we very much encourage people um, putting in nominations to come, to bring other members of their, their teams, other partners. That's really the whole point of the workshop, is to bring people together for some uh, really good discussions and um, discovery. and. And, and creativity and thinking about how we're going to manage the landscape together into the future and, and considering climate change. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I I think I prematurely ended the presentation because I didn't want to jump into the specific questions right away without getting back to some of the questions that might have circled back for you. But I think there are a couple slides I should go ahead and hit. And, and that's that, you know, we want your input. We need to know what baseline conditions, assessments, and inventories are out there. We need to know about ongoing or completed conservation actions, who's doing what, where. We need to know about existing objectives and indicators and targets that you guys have out there to help us identify the appropriate uh, objectives, indicators, targets, and, and even helps with identification of, of those pilot areas. Uh, we need you to address the pressures and stressors survey that will be coming out. Uh, we need your help in prioritizing these pilot geographies for planning and design. We're going to especially need your help when we start to assess vulnerabilities of conservation priorities uh, in focal areas and in the scenario planning. So in this, we're going to prepare those two to three pilot landscape conservation designs where we're going to identify those critical conservation actions and develop adaptation strategies. And we're going to actually work real hard on the, on the collaborative side of this um, so that we can leverage the resources for collective impact. The goals for the workshop are to engage key partners and develop a shared vision for that conservation action, collate objectives, indicators, and targets related to our local ecosystems from individual organizations, determine those design priorities, including those conservation goals for those systems and those critical pressures, and identify those pilot areas to work in that climate smart framework. Um, and I think here's kind of what you were getting to with that question is the, what are the workshop benefits to you or your agency? Why should you attend? Um, one, in this process, you're going to learn how to do the climate smart adaptation planning and landscape conservation design approach. Um, you'll be involved in the nomination of pilot landscape uh, for that climate smart adaptation uh, planning process. You'll begin to understand what data is available and a process for using it to answer management and planning questions that might be relevant to you or your agency. And I'm assuming that it will be, otherwise you wouldn't be nominating an area. Um, you'll have the opportunity to, uh, to leverage funding and partnerships and build coalitions to help deliver conservation in your landscape, whether or not your area is chosen. Um, there will be those people at this meeting that are the types of people that you need to identify and work with to be more efficient in the future. We've all learned that we can't do things on our own. You position your organization to streamline their future conservation planning efforts with integration across geographical boundaries. Um, you'll be able to identify important information gaps um, that will be shared by others so that maybe you can more efficiently address those. Um, and there's that broad audience of potential partners and funders um, for the different uh, implementation actions or science needs that, that will be identified at this meeting. And you'll help fulfill your organization's needs or mandates for climate change adaptation planning. So I think there are, are multiple benefits for being there. 
And here are the contacts for the landscape conservation planning and design team. So if you want to reach out to any of us, please feel free to do so. So did going over that last slide actually help with what you were asking? Yeah, it did. I, I didn't realize that aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great comment, Lori. Thanks, Dwayne, for giving us information about that. And <laughs> Thanks, Dwayne, for stopping. Did you have another question? I see your hand is still raised. Oh, no, I don't. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Peter, Elsa, do you have a question? Okay, anyone else? Peter lowered his hand. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone else? Uh, Jeannie, um, I see your hand is raised. You can press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, Jeannie, yeah. I can hear you. Okay. Um, well, going through this, um, I'm, I'm thinking of two key questions that's probably on everybody's mind uh, who are considering uh, nominating pilot areas are the size of the area and also um, the scope of potential collaborators um, and, and from experience with other kind of similar efforts, uh, most recently with the uh, Fort Huachuca uh, effort that was a couple of years ago. Um, the the size of the pilot area as far as being you know manageable as being both pertinent and manageable um i'm sure folks are thinking well how big should we make this should it be a watershed should it be um uh one of the those four key areas like the BLM uh set out um and the bigger you make them the more the harder they are to uh, engage collaborators and and keep collaborator commitment going and so on but so um, you know it's 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 useful to have the overlapping geographies but we're all kind of thinking well how big should it be so that it's not so unmanageable when you've got people you know on other either side of a state or something like that that you know, it's hard to keep people engaged if they don't feel a, a more of a local ownership for it. And so I was wondering if, if uh, folks have been talking about uh, the social aspect of, of the pilot design. Um, this is Genevieve. I'm the coordinator for the Desert LTC. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Um, I'll, I'll tackle that question because we have talked about that quite a bit and we specifically did not require a certain size in this nomination form because we really wanted to get at that idea of what's important to our partners um, it, on the social scale, on understanding what's important in your backyard and pulling all of that information from you. So we hope that the scale of the project is derived from the nominations that we receive. Um, and that's why, going back to Amy's point about the workshops and, and Dwayne's presentation, where we think that we might be able to combine some if people feel that their, their scale is really important, um, but maybe it's a little bit too small for doing um, the data research or things like that, and we want to be able to connect those people together. Um, other people might have really good partnerships that are already working on, on a very large watershed scale, for instance, and that might already be an adequate um, size um, based on the existing partnerships and the existing work and the existing needs. And so we want to encourage everybody to do your nomination um, based on what you know and, and what you're working in, and then let's see what happens in terms of other things that come in and have that opportunity to talk more about scale and maybe potentially combine some things um, through, as we go through this process. Does that answer your question? I, I want to emphasize something Jen just said, and that is that if you do have what you might think is a smaller geography, and so you're kind of worried about it being landscape scale, 
don't be afraid of that because I, I think in that slide that I showed, I showed some really some some things that were small relative to other things. There might be somebody out there that you don't realize is a natural partner for you who might be proposing something juxtaposed to yours or that might even encompass the area that you're looking at. And so yours might get um, absorbed into or, or worked in to that other nomination. Amy, thank you for your um, comment and question. Anyone else um, have a question? Feel free to raise your hand or star six to unmute yourself to ask a question or make a comment. Okay, Sergio um, is going to say something, and then we'll get to the last uh, question. Sergio? Uh, thank you. Uh, de hecho, para nuestros amigos en México o en español, solamente recordarles que este seminario lo vamos a hacer el martes eh, y podemos ahí contestar sus preguntas, eh, pero voy a hacer la misma descripción de cómo eh, someter áreas piloto para este proyecto y hablar sobre los, los talleres en Tucson y en Aguascalientes eh, más adelante este año. Gracias. Thank you, Sergio. Celeste is raising her hand. Celeste will take your question. Unmute. You can unmute yourself by pressing star six. Celeste? Okay, I think I'm, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Can you go back to the timeline slide, please? Thank you. I just wanted to take down some notes for that one. Sally, this is Christina. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Christina. So I have a couple of questions on the four optional uh, questions. Is there a limit on the amount of space we can use? Is that considered part of the six pages or not? Christina, this is Dwayne Poole, and I've had that question from a couple of other people already, and this, and we haven't really talked about it, but there was a six-page or less limit that was basically applied, and if you if you apply that just to the 12 questions, that gives you more room to explain in those 12 questions, but if you choose to answer the optional questions, that would limit the amount that you have if you kept it to that six-page limit. So what I've been telling people is to... Um, do do questions one through twelve and make sure that maintains the six page limit and then under a separate heading say optional questions and then if you have more information to add to those that that's beyond that six page limit. Thank you, Duane. That's very helpful. And I did not check back with my other cooperators on that, so I went way out on a limb, but it just I was getting those questions boom, 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 and several of them were in meetings, so I made an executive decision, and it might have been wrong, but I'm, I want to be consistent with everybody. Great. That 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 really does help. <laughs> Thank you, Christina and uh, Celeste. Anyone else have any other questions? I think Amy Robertson, our science coordinator, will take something now. Sure. I am um, again. I want to apologize that we didn't uh, do proper introductions of our team in the in the beginning of the call. Um, Dwayne, do you want to tell them a little bit about yourself, really quickly, and uh, your role in all of this, just to make sure that's clear? Sure. Um, my name is Dwayne Cool. I'm a landscape ecologist for Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory. Um, I am one of the principal investigators for the Landscape Conservation Planning and Design Project. Um, along with Louise Mistel, who can't be on the call today, uh, from Sky Island Alliance. And um, I am very involved with the Desert LCC. I've been on the steering committee since inception, and I sit on um, one of the critical management question teams and the, a couple of other working groups that we, that we have in the LCC. So I've been fairly engaged in the Desert LCC for a number of years now, and um, I'm really excited about this project because this starts to pull together um, existing science, management concerns, and a lot of those sorts of things into 
uh, spatial targeted delivery that people like landscape ecologists tend to get a little bit giddy over. So uh, I'm really kind of glad to be a part of this project. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me um, or to any of the people on that last slide that we'll show. And Dwayne, can you forward back to that last slide again? We are we are at the top of the hour, a little past it now, so we need to start to wrap up. Oops. Thanks, Dwayne. So again, this is Amy Robertson. I'm the science coordinator uh, from the Desert LCC. You've also heard from Genevieve Johnson, our coordinator, and Sally Hall, our data coordinator. Uh, in the room here with me are Louise Mistal uh, from Sky Island Alliance and Sergio Avila from the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum, who are also part of this core team uh, working on this initiative. And then we also have Tani Robertson uh, from Southwest Decision Resources, who could not be here today. And so as Dwayne said, he's the primary point of contact on general questions. Um, and uh, he can then relay those to any of us if, if it's a uh, something we need to answer. So um, please contact Dwayne if you have any questions at all, and we'll find someone, the right person to answer it. And I just want to thank everyone, um, especially Dwayne, uh, for taking the lead on this um, overall project and, and this webinar today. Um, I want to thank you all for making time to participate and uh, for your interest in this. We've been getting um, a lot of questions. We all have been. And uh, we're very excited about the enthusiasm that, that our partners are expressing about this project. And I really want to emphasize again what, what we've said a few times and, and Dwayne said very well um, on his workshop slide is that we want this to be an overall collaborative and, and learning process for everyone. So even if your particular area um, doesn't end up as a pilot geography, um, we intend, uh, our intention is to make this valuable to you, um, this process and, and learning. And really we're all learning together as we move forward, um, managing natural resources and conserving natural resources in the face of climate change is a challenge that we are all facing, presents many problems that are just too big for any one of us to face alone. And so um, we are really looking to have a collective impact um, and to do positive things and, and figure out what is possible in terms of adaptation and what are those most critical conservation actions that, that we can work on together. So please join us um, for one or both of those workshops. And um, please submit your nominations. We're very, very excited to um, take a look at those and, and start um, discussing them and, and really getting into this process.